You've been stirring up trouble a long time. There has now been created in the United States a permission structure for uselessness. This sort of idea that you can take all the right actions and that there is no correlation between that and success is such a lie, and it's a malicious lie. My plan is to not retire. Are you allowed to say that? I said that one time, I got just excoriated by people. So I wasn't saying that you can never retire. They have to be nine year old working in a salt mine. Ben hates old people. My wife hates it when this happens during a, a home argument, by the way. She'll be like, we're not in a YouTube video. You need to stop this right now. <laughs> yeah, how do you argue with Ben Shapiro at home? This does make me angry. I think politicians on all sides of the aisle have an interest in lying to the American people. It kind of goes with this whole idea of that the American dream is dead. This hopelessness that is pervading out there. Do you think we're done? Ben Shapiro, I'm proud of you. You are blowing up, man. You hey, thank are you so much. It. You are well, owning it. You're yeah. a breath of fresh air in the talk radio world. Yeah, I, get to, I get to skim the cream, right? I, I go down to, to Florida, and I hang out with my very small team over there, and Jeremy and Caleb do the hard work of running the daily business, and then I ask them hard questions, and, and they get angry at me because I'm not the one who's actually doing it, and, and that's kind of how the company operates, and so far, so good. You come in and, and you flip know, the table. Just, yeah, yeah. just <laughs> continually upsetting Jeremy and Caleb. That might be a good hobby. That might be, that might be good. <laughs> their, their friends are wonderful. It's a wonderful company, and we're glad to have them uh, in the Nashville community. We share... Ideas back and forth and uh, concerns back and forth. We had a great uh, discussion about cancel culture one time. All of us got together and learned some things from each other on how to protect and how to do that stuff. But before we dive into some subjects that you've been talking about and that we share in common, um, we share something else in common. Uh, I learned from Jeremy, confirmed it with you later, that uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, mm -hmm. my good friend, I, I met him because I read his book, Thou Shall Prosper. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and this is one of my favorite books on uh, money and economics, um, and definitely in the top 10 of books I've ever read on the subject. And it's why Jewish people have a ten an inordinate statistical tendency to prosper above the population. But anyway, Aside from that, Rabbi Lappin plays a big part in your personal story. Yeah, so uh, Rabbi Lappin was the rabbi of a shul. It was called the Shul on Venice Beach, a synagogue on mm -hmm. Venice Beach. My, my parents had become, you know, slightly more orthodox, and then they were kind of getting drawn more toward orthodoxy, and they really became orthodox with Rabbi Lappin. They, they would drive down to Venice every weekend, uh, every every Shabbat. You're not supposed to drive, but that's the synagogue they would go to. And um, he would talk. He's a very charismatic guy, Rabbi Lappin. And the community really started to grow. And they ended up, because of that, moving into a Jewish community that was closer to where we lived. And I would say that he played a, a very heavy role in my parents becoming Orthodox in the first place. For those of you, to translate, my interpretation of that would be that they were more culturally Jewish before. And Orthodox is as they became uh, much more dialed in on the book. Well, and really, really keep, the keeping practice. kosher and exactly. other things as well, but but also more serious about their walk with God. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when, when you become Orthodox, it really is about the practice. So Judaism is very Aristotelian. Judaism is, is sort of the idea that, that the, the more things you do, the closer you get to God. So it's a very act-based religion, and Rabbi Lappin talks about this a lot, um, yeah, that the way that you become a virtuous person, as Aristotle suggests, is to do virtuous things. That's how you kind of cultivate virtue in, in yourself. And Judaism really believes that the mitzvot, the commandments, that's what God gave those to us for, right? It's, it's not that they have some sort of magical impact on the universe. There's some mystics who think that, but, but the real kind of hard-nosed work of doing the thing every day is a reminder not only that you're subject to God's rules, but also cultivate virtue in, in your life. And, and so what you're doing when you say a blessing, like I just had some water and you can see me kind of mutter to myself, I'm saying a blessing before I have the water, that's to remind me that, you know, God is the one who, who gives the water. And so, you know, gratitude, right? that's how you cultivate the virtue of gratitude. And, and that, that kind of stuff is happening all the time. Right? We have hundreds of commandments that we keep. Those aren't incumbents on people who are not Jewish. But when you become Orthodox, what you do is you accept a system where you basically say, there's a bunch of rules that aren't set by me and that make my life better and my community better and that draw me closer to, to those virtues, draw, draw me closer to God through my behavior and recognizing that there's a system of success in the world that, that God has created. That I mean, God's pretty clear in the Old Testament that there is a correlation between you following the commandments and you experiencing success in your life. And if you're Christian, obviously many of those commandments are no longer obligatory on you because of the New Testament. If you're Jewish, they, they still are, according to us anyway. And, and so what that means is that it's not, as, it's not prosperity gospel. It's not if you do everything right, you know, money will descend upon you. But as a general rule, if you do things right, there's a much better chance that you're going to have success. Exactly. Cause and effect. If you do these things, you'll be blessed. You do these things, you'll be cursed. Exactly. Uh, the speech that uh, God gave through Moses right before the children cross the Jordan. These are the blessings. These are the cursings. You do this. And some of them are things that we talk about. Borrowing is an example. If you want to be cursed, you'll be a borrower. If you want to be blessed, you'll be a lender. 
you know, and uh, th those things fit right into that. So very, very cool. I'm so, curious. Go ahead. I'm just curious, growing up in California, what was money like in, in your house growing up? Did your parents, you know, were they were they wealthy? Was it like, hey, we're starting from ground zero here? So my, my parents were, I would say, very middle class. So I, I grew up in a... a That's kind of popular to say right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you actually asked me that question. So you didn't ask me about inflation. Then I started talking about how I'm middle class. I grew up in a middle class house. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we grew up in a two bedroom, 1100 square foot house in Burbank, California. I had three sisters. So I shared a room with, with all of my siblings until I was 11. We had one bathroom for six people. Uh, you know, fairly small house. My mom was a secretary at a TV company. My dad was a composer, which means that, you know, he was playing piano in a restaurant because that's that's how it works in, in California. <laughs> if, if you're not actually, you know, a successful film composer, then just like everybody in California who has a script, you end up a barista. If you are, if my dad is a, is a, a really, really good jazz pianist who's playing clubs from the time he was 14 years old. And so he was playing in a restaurant on Mondays and Tuesday nights. So a lot of my childhood, I remember sitting at the restaurant, watching him play piano at the restaurant and be excited when somebody dropped like a $10 bill in the tip jar. And, you know, as we got older, we moved into a slightly bigger house. We ended up in 2,400 square foot house with, with four bedrooms when I was 11. And that's where my parents were up until we all moved to Florida a few years ago. So we kind of went from, you know, I'd say middle, lower middle class to middle class to Upper middle class. Certainly, we were never rich. Uh, and uh, your law degree is from Harvard. Yes. Did you get a free ride? Uh, no, I, I paid that one. Wow. Yeah, I was I was already writing by that point, right? So I, I'd already written some books. I'd already you know written some articles. Okay, so you had and the this, ability of cash flow. Yeah, okay. I, I had some. And cash you were flow. twenty years old when you were at Harvard Law. Yeah, I, I started when I was twenty. Yeah. Wow. Because I, I started UCLA when I was sixteen. So when I when I went to Harvard, I mean. The, the truth is that, that that's a good bet for uh, for a loan officer, right? You're giving a loan to somebody who's going to Harvard Law, chance of high income from Harvard Law, very good, right? I mean, educational loan business is, is a scam, but not if you're getting a degree from Harvard Law where everybody's going to go work for a big law firm for the first couple of years. I worked at a big law firm for about eight months, decided I hated it and, and quit. And uh, it was actually really So you funny. knew that you wanted to lean into that kind of media side at a young age? Yeah, I was, I was a nationally syndicated columnist when I was 17. So I, when I when I went to when I went to college when I was sixteen, I, I thought that I was going to double major in music and genetic science because I was a virtuosic violinist at the time. And you can find videos of, on YouTube of me playing when I'm eleven years old at, at big banquets and stuff like that. I was a much cuter kid. And uh, and then you know I go to UCLA, I pick up the UCLA Daily Bruin. There's an article in there comparing Ariel Sharon, then the Prime Minister of Israel, to Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi. And I walked into the office and I said, "Can I write a counter to that?" And they said, "Sure." And that morphed into a regular column there. I then applied cold to Creator Syndicate, which was a syndicator for a bunch of different columnists left and right. And they didn't know my age. And they, they said, sure, they picked me up. Uh, my parents had to sign the contract because I wasn't of legal age You were yet. a minor at that point. I was a minor. Wow. Uh, and so I, I started writing a syndicated column when I was 17. My first book came out when I was 20, when I was graduating from, from UCLA. It was called Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth. Uh, my second book, came out while I was at Harvard Law, and it was titled Porn Generation, How Social Liberalism is Corrupting Our Future. That was 2005. You've been stirring up trouble a long time. Yeah, I've been in this for a while. I mean, I'm 40, but I've been in this for, you know, 23 years. Yeah. I mean, uh, so it's, I've been doing this for, for, for quite a while. So when I went to Harvard Law, you know, that, that was a good bet, even though I, I knew the chances of me practicing law long term were pretty bad. And the truth is, that's also true of pretty much everybody at Harvard Law. 50% of people in my Harvard Law class aren't in law at all. Most of them went on to start businesses, you know, become investors and, and, and that sort of thing. Very cool. So I'm 64. My plan is to not retire. I plan to stay on the microphone. Uh, are you allowed to say and, that? And, I said that one time. Um, I got um, excoriated by well, people. Well, that's what I wanted to bring up. <laughs> that's what I wanted to bring up. You said it's insane that we have raised, haven't have raised the retirement age in the U.S. I think there's two parts to this argument. Um uh, there's a social security math problem of the uh, arbitrary age 65 thing, but there's also then the philosophy of what is retirement and why did we create this idea that we're, we work at something we hate long enough and hard enough that we don't have to do anything. And that, that's, that seems to be counterproductive. It doesn't seem to be a good spiritual walk to me. It doesn't seem to be good emotionally balanced to me. You know, I, I can't find retirement in the Bible. And, and I'm not condemning someone who is retiring, but philosophically, I want to talk about retirement, or we do. And also, I want to talk about this idea. It's, you know, the end of that quote from you is it's not fiscally sustainable, you know, to quit at 65 when you've got a, you know, a pretty good likelihood if you make it to 65. Statistically, you're probably going to be 90. So you've got, you know, those numbers start to be screwy with Social Security. Yep. 
I mean, so as you say, there's two arguments there. The one I think I got hit more on was the virtue argument that you were making about you know, the virtue of work and and how it's not good to have a mentality at 65 that you're basically going to. Re- and when I said retirement, what I meant was like actual retirement, like go sit on a beach somewhere, move down to the villages, drink at 3 p.m., you know, like that that sort of thing. I wasn't talking about people who decide that, you know, their back is broken from having worked a job for, for 30 years. And now what they want to do is work in their community. And what they want to do is work a part time job, go teach at the local school, do charity work. That's not retirement to me. When I'm thinking of retirement, I'm talking about like retirement, retirement. And I do think that income is a good incentive for people to continue to work because I mean, I've worked with enough people in the charity sphere that it turns out that working for little or no recompense is difficult to sustain over time. There are certain people who will work for free because they're just that community minded. But the truth is that people want to feel some sort of fiscal and financial reward for for the work that they're doing, even if it's not, you know, the kind of pay they could be making full time in the in the private sector for profit industry. And, And so, you know, on the virtue point. What I see is an increasingly depressed America because people don't value work in the way that I think that work ought to be valued. And a country that has set up an expectation that work itself is somehow bad and unfulfilling. And, and that's a weird thing, particularly in an age when you're not working at a loom, right? You're not working in the coal mines, typically. I mean, there are people who obviously are, but, but the reality is the vast majority of people who are, who are you know, aching for retirement are, are sitting at a keyboard right now, or at least a, a huge number of them are. I wouldn't say the vast majority, a huge number of them are. And so this idea that like what you're really straining for is 25 years of sitting on a beach, like I, I just don't know where the virtue is in that. Vacation's great, I love it, but there's a reason vacation ain't a full-time job. And you know, the n- lack of involvement in your community, lack of involvement in your family life, and again, jobs don't have to be, you know, making, going and working in a Making the human race better. Yes, exactly. I mean, my, engage, like, engage in something. My, my sister's a stay-at-home mom. She's making the human race better by sitting home and homeschooling her kids and, and making sure that everything's... My wife, the doctor, right, after she had the last baby, she dropped out of the workforce and is taking care of the baby. And eventually she'll probably go back in part-time. You know, that she's working, right? That's it, that, that is a form of work. The point that I was making is that we as a society have degraded work. And when you have government programs that are designed to degrade work, that basically say... Work hard and then we'll take care of you the rest of your life and you never have to work again. That's seeing work in, I think, a perverse way. And then obviously you have the fiscally unsustainable reality that is Social Security, a giant pyramid scheme with an aging population where everyone knows and every politician lies about it. They they all lie. Everyone knows we're either going to have to radically increase taxes or radically reduce benefits in the next few years. Everyone knows this is going to happen. Or radically increase debt. Yes, right. I mean, and and they keep saying they're going to grow their way out of it, but I just don't see that. There is a rat snake mathematically. Yes. There really is. Mm. That's scary. So what are your what are your thoughts about the extreme side of that? The financial independent retire early. The people who say, "Hey, at 45, I want to be work optional and I'm going to have enough money piled up that I can leave this job that I hate." I mean, saying you want to leave the job you hate for another thing, I think is is fine. I mean, if you hate your job and you want to find a better job or you want to find a better thing to do with your life, that's fine. But I'll tell you, I I have a lot of friends who are billionaires, uh, and many of them became billionaires in the tech world at the age of 35, 40, right? They sold their companies, they made a ton of money, and then they quote unquote retired. And they are just itching. You can see them itching. They want to start a new thing. Yeah, I mean, they they go and they start new things, whether it's charity work or whether it's starting a new business. People have an urge to create, and creators particularly have an urge to create. I think when God says at the the beginning of Genesis that that we're made in his image, one of the things that makes us like God is our creative capacity, right? The only thing that God's done in the Bible to that point is create everything. So when it says that humans are made in God's image, we're the only creature really that has the ability to independently create. And so when you stop that creative process, when you stop creating, which is really a form of building, then you lose something in yourself. And I I think that's a a real negative for the soul. You know, Rabbi taught me something else on that that was interesting, um, that the Hebrew word for worship— and it is very similar or almost exactly the same word for work ship. Mm-hmm. To work is a form of worship. And in the New Testament, we would say to do your work as unto the Lord. But but it's to, this idea that working in something that you were designed, the way you were designed to do, the way you were knit in your mother's womb, the way you were uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it, and the way he is bent, the old King James says, and the way the child is bent, train up a child that the way they're designed and let them go in that, that that is a form of worship. I remember the, uh, I was just in Scotland and in, at St. Andrews where they shot the, uh, the scene, the opening scene from Chariots of Fire. And one of the lines in there was, he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a form of, work can be a form of worship when you, and it's not workaholism. It's not some kind of weird spiritual thing. By the way, we worked but, in the garden. Right. I mean, the, the, like the, the actual 
verse that talks about what Adam is tasked with doing in the garden, it uses the the, the verb is, is lavod, right? Is to, is to work. It says that you have to actually avod, you have to work. And then it says, and vilishmor, and to guard, right? So you're, you're there to work and you're to guard. Well, what, what kind of work is there to do in the garden, right? It's the Garden of Eden. Everything is perfect. Everything's wonderful, right? You got trees with fruit. You got animals you can name. Everything is awesome. And the idea is that even in the Garden of Eden, it's not going to be a Garden of Eden unless you have a task. People have to have a thing to do. And we're a bored society, and you can see us tearing ourselves apart because we don't have a thing to do. I think it increases anxiety and all, all the other things as well. I think we saw some of that during the, uh, the pandemic. When we told people they weren't essential. Uh, it creates a different kind of mental illness then because there's a, uh, this idea that I'm not worthy to worship. I'm not worthy to do those things. And, and uh, you know, I, I raised a couple of daughters and a son that, that are all married off now. And uh, we had all dad jokes for the raising the teenage girls. It's like, you know, but before Adam got a woman, he got work. So <laughs> if you're going to come date my daughter, you need to be talking yeah. about having a job or having a career. Yeah. I, just, I just saw Professor Scott Galloway mention that what women are looking for in a man is the ability to provide in the future. Psychologically, that's what they're actually looking for. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of people who are living at home in their 30s who don't have a job they love to do, and their growth is stunted because of that. And it seems to be hurting culture all around. Yeah. There's probably a deeper problem when it starts with education. When we tell people, get good grades, do the homework, go to college, get a degree, then do a job for 40 years. Do you think that's part of the issue? Well, I, I think that we are all in this sort of post-50s mindset where we think of, of the way that work was in the 50s, and we think that that is sort of the ideal of how work ought to be, which is very weird because the truth is that many of the jobs in the 50s are, are jobs that nobody would want to do. We talk about the idea that you worked at like GM at a factory for 30 years and then got a gold watch doing rivets. Like how many people do you see in the modern world who want to stand over a machine doing rivets? That's not a thing. The 1950s are an outlier in human history. They're, not, they're an outlier because basically the rest of the world had been completely destroyed and the only industrial superpower on earth that had not been completely destroyed was the United States, which meant that we could essentially have one person in the house, one person who was working full time, making a great wage, doing a repetitive mechanical task. And that ended up collapsing in the 1960s and 70s, which is why you see America's debt problems start to explode in the 1960s and the 1970s. But if you go back before that, the reality is that everybody was a cooperative unit in the family in terms of work. I mean, you go back far enough and you go back to a farm and everybody's working all the time, right? If you go back to Proverbs, there's an entire section of Proverbs where it describes the ideal woman, right? We sing it every Friday night. It's called Deshes Chayel, right? It's, it's the, the woman of valor. And that, that, that whole section of Proverbs is all about how what the woman does. It talks about her starting a business. It talks about her, you know, importing goods. It's like, it, it sounds like she started a corporation is what it sounds like, the woman of valor. And, and so I think that, you know, that, that vision of, of what life is, is that like, you just go into the job and you stay at the job for 30 years. That's not how the market really historically worked. And it's not how the market works right now. And, and I think our educational system is not designed for that. It was designed to churn out people who are supposed to fit in sort of particular tasks. I see with my son and right? my son is sort of heterodox thinker. He's eight years old. He is you know, good at math. He can't sit still because he's an eight-year-old boy. And what I see is that the stuff that he's really interested in, he's really interested in. And what a good educational system would do, and this is what we try and do at home with him, is dig into the stuff he's really interested in and use that as a gateway to learn the things that he's going to need to do you know, in the world. In the way and he's bent. It, exactly. And, and instead, what we try to do is bend the kid to fit the, to fit the, the hole in the market. And, and that seems, you know, it enervates, it makes people feel uncomfortable and angry because they feel as though they're, they're being turned away from the thing they want to do in favor of the thing that, quote unquote, society wants them to do. And, and that's, I don't think it's necessary. What do you see about the American dream? What's your feeling about that? Because you, you're doing a whole lot of politics right now. Yeah. That's what you do, obviously. But I mean, at, at this moment when we're taping this, you're traveling, go, stumping, going state to state, working with uh, the, the politicians out there. The thing that we've been running into and pushing back against the, in the wealth building side, that this idea that the American dream is dead, this hopelessness that is pervading out there. Do you think we're done? No, and I don't think we're remotely done. I think that, that the ingratitude that it demonstrates to suggest that the American dream is dead in a time of unique prosperity in human history, where the poorest people in our society have the best technologies available to them, literally in human history, where you have a magic machine in your pocket that you dial, you hit a button, and a good arrives at your door for a cheap price inside of 24 hours, and you're sitting there going, the dream is dead. I mean, we have these things that are time machines. They're called airplanes. Fly to other places on Earth and spend like five minutes there, and you realize just how much yep. the American dream is not dead. And I think that politicians on all sides of the aisle, this, this, this does make me angry. I think politicians on all sides of the aisle have an interest in lying to the American people about this because there's this mentality that if I tell you that the American dream is dead, 
then only I can save you. Only I have the ability right. to come in and rescue you from this crisis that has been created for you. When the reality is the steps towards success in a free society are the same as they always were. Take responsible action. Go get an education. Go get a job. Make smart financial decisions. Make a smart decision about your family. You know, the entire entertainment arena is geared towards stories of people overcoming obstacles that are very often made by them. You know, the, the, the reality is, you know, when people say, what's your life story? My, my life story is that I had the ultimate privilege, two amazing parents. And then I made a series of what I think are rational, calculated decisions. And it worked out well. That's my life. There's not all that much that's like super fascinating about that. It, the, the, there are obstacles you have to overcome along the way, things that you don't expect. But th this sort of idea that you can take all the right actions and that there is no correlation between that and success is such a lie. And it's a malicious lie. And it teaches people not to take the actions. It, it enervates them. It makes them feel like if I if I do all the right things, there's no point to it. So what's the point of doing? Because doing the right thing is actually harder than doing the wrong thing. And I think politicians lie about this all the damn time. I think it's ugly. I think it's hideous. I, I think that it, it kills the American spirit. The American people are a people of pioneers. That's what we are. That's why we all like Westerns, right? Pion we're a pioneering people. We're a bunch of people who came from Europe or from or from Asia or from wherever, but at the very beginning from Europe. To from get North, away from restrictions. To get away from restrictions into a place that was far less secure, right? Into a continent that was totally uncultivated and where you had the chance of being killed by disease or the environment or, or the natives at, at any moment. And, and then that wasn't enough. They started crossing mountains to go to more of these uncultivated places and facing more hardships and more stresses. And then you have new waves of, of immigrants who are coming from more secure places where there is a guarantee of, of you, you being able to grow up where your parents grew up and going to a place where you don't speak the language, where you don't know anything. And I think that's the story of virtually everybody who's in the United States right now, or at least huge percentages of it, like parents or grandparents or great grandparents who at some point abandoned the place where they were more secure to come to a place where they were far less secure for the opportunity. Are you telling me that my kids have less opportunity in America today, in 2024, than my great grandparents did when they showed up in like 1907, not speaking a word of English and get off the boat. And by the way, no real welfare programs, no giant social safety net. And the idea was you learn English and you do the work and then you will get ahead. Th this arrogance that we are, we are the most victimized generation. Like what the, what are you even saying? What are you talking about? By what metric are you the most victimized generation? That sounds harsh because people kind of cherish that sense of victimization because it throws the responsibility on somebody else. But, you know, first first law of, of good management is look in the mirror, not through the window, right? First law is if there's a problem and you look through the window at the thing that, that is responsible for the thing that's making you miserable, you're not going to solve the problem. If you look in the mirror, even if it's true that you can't solve it, if you look in the mirror, you better take the steps to at least try to solve it first. Control the controllables. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've seen. And most people are focusing on all the things they can't control. And that's why they're so desperate for that politician to fix their life. And also the gap between surviving and thriving has, has changed. The spectrum has changed. Back in our parents' and grandparents' days, it was literally survive. Put a roof over your head, food on the table. Now we have a different problem where they go, well, I want the American dream today in my own way, and I want to shortcut it. I want a house now. I want a car now. I want to have all my dreams now. Is that part of the problem is that we've shortcut it with debt and other Bad I mean, solutions. That, that, that for sure is true. And it's also the, the fascinating statistic about how many Americans have, have moved. And the, the number of Americans who are moving now is lower than at any time in modern American history. Americans are basically staying where they were, even though moving is actually much easier than it was 40, 50 years ago. And my parents were transplants to a couple different locations, right? They started off in Chicago, they moved to Boston to go to college, and then they end up in Los Angeles, and now they're in Florida, right? My, I spent my entire life in L.A., it came a point where it was not sustainable anymore. We moved our company to Nashville and we moved to Florida, right? The, the, this, this sort of idea, it's not just, I want a house and I want a car. It's, I want a house and I want a car in precisely the area I want the house and the car. And if I can't and get that- And the size of house. I mean, we can go back to your parents' story that they stayed in 2,400 square feet until just a couple of years ago. Yes. And it started with you in 1,100 feet. Yes. Which I, I started in 1,100 feet. Now, I'm older than you by 25 years, but still, I mean- and and that was California real estate, so super expensive because they were in L.A. at the time. But still, th this idea that um, eleven hundred square feet—you've got to be kidding me! Under what planet should I live there? I'm twenty-one years oh, old. Yeah. Well, Why would say, I live in eleven hundred feet? My parents feet? bought a house for eight, and I'm like, go yeah. look at that house. You, you, you don't want to live you there. You boomers <laughs> don't understand. You bought your houses for a basket of strawberries. Exactly. <laughs> you don't understand. You don't grasp what's really going on. So I think that. our expectations and standards have expectations. shifted to be impossible. Um, I, I think that also because people have you know a a brain quirk that makes them think that. If something is what it is today, it was always like that. They look at people who live in giant houses and they think that person was always rich. 
Right. I, I get this crap all the time, right? I mean, it's like, oh my God, you must have grown up rich. I mean, you're very wealthy trust now, fund. which means you grew up, right, you're a trust fund baby. And I think to myself, no, I want, like, where are you possibly getting that? That doesn't even, that like, what, what? In fact, I'll tell you, the number of people who are truly, like, generationally wealthy that I know, the number of them who are trust fund babies is vanishingly small. Like, the, the, the richest people that I know, literal, and I know the richest people, right? I mean, like, Elon, you're talking about people, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, you know, these, virtually none of them grew up trust fund babies, right. right? A huge number of them grew up actually really poor or at least at the very least middle class. And then they made a bunch of good decisions. I mean, again, for, for all of us, we all have these stories, right? When I got started in my career and I was writing, I was writing for free. I'd write for free just to get my stuff out there. Yep. And my wife and I remember driving to like the local Republican club in Orange County to find a bunch of 80 year old women. And by a bunch, I mean like 15 and then sell books out of the back of my car at 20 bucks a pop. And if we came away with $200, that was like an amazing day. And everyone has those stories. That's exactly what we did. That's why we have the trunk of a car out here in the lobby with books in it, because that's how it started. And, the, you know, the, the psalm over it, don't despise small beginnings. And we know from the largest uh, the research that we did, the largest research project on millionaires ever done in North America, over 10,000 of them we studied, that 89% of America's millionaires, it's about 21 million of them right now, are not millionaires. This is data. It's not a feeling. It's a fact are not millionaires because of inherited money. 89%. That's nine out of 10. That should give everyone hearing that number every time I put it out, great hope that the American dream is not over. And, and by the way, you can see it in the stats. I mean, one of the things that Thomas Sowell likes to point out is he says, you know, whenever he's talking about disparities in, in income, he says, you know what the greatest disparity in wealth is between older people and younger people? Because you get wealthier as you get older if you do it right. Ooh. Right? I mean, this is, this is one of those things that, that, you know, if you make smart financial decisions, meaning don't day trade, then you can actually get wealthy by making solid financial decisions and then just sticking with those positions over the long haul. Compound growth, your income goes up. I'm the only I'm the only that. rapper in, in the history of rap who put the magic of compound interest in a in a top charting <laughs> rap song. I, I did I did insist on that. That was like my insistence. Eminem's been real quiet since he dropped that track. And I make racks off compound interest. Y'all live with your parents. Tom McDonald was like, "Well, I, you write your set of the lyrics." I was like, "Okay." The only thing I want, I insist. I actually wanted EBITDA in there also, but but I actually ended up only <laughs> with uh, with the magic of compound interest. That's amazing. <laughs> That's I'm curious fabulous. how how has your view of wealth changed as you've actually been built it. You know, there's a view of wealth we have when we're young and we're striving. Has it changed for you now that you're kind of in a different phase? Maybe, maybe in some ways. Uh, you know, listen, I, I was always ambitious to make more money. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make any bones about this. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that, you know, I didn't get into the business I was in in order to make money. You don't go into the political commentary business because you think you're just going to be loaded at the end of the day. In fact, every time I tried to make money in a way that was not my passion, it ended up failing. Right, which, I, which I think is another thing that, that folks don't realize about people who tend to make a lot of money is the reason they got into the business that they're in typically was not for the money. Right. It's because that's where their creative capacity was. So, for example, I, I mentioned I went to law school at Harvard Law. Right, You come out, you have a trajectory now. You're going to make a lot of money because you go to Harvard Law, the chances you end up poor are pretty low. So you know, I go, I work at a firm called Goodwin Proctor. And I'm like, you know, I, first of all, I had the worst interview record in the history of Harvard Law because I was conservative and that, that didn't work out well with the law firm. But... <laughs> After I took my books off my resume, I got a job and I ended up working in like real estate law. And so I'm sitting at this beautiful office in Century City and looking out, you know, over the over the hills toward the ocean. And it's 2007. And so there's no work, right? It's the end of the it's the end of 2007. The real estate market has collapsed. You're sitting there doing nothing all day. And I am absolutely miserable. And I was making what was, you know, great money coming out of law school. It's like one hundred eighty thousand dollars. And it was coming out of law school. That's a lot of money. And it's still a lot of money. I was dating my wife at the time. We'd gotten engaged. And she saw, you're, she's like, you're absolutely miserable. You're, you, you're losing weight. You're miserable. You hate this. You should quit. And I said, okay, I mean, I'm going to make a, you know, I don't have a job. And she said, well, don't worry. You're like, I have faith that you'll, you'll be able to get a job because you have a degree. You're a smart person. You'll figure it out. And if we have to live on a lot less, we'll live on a lot less so you don't have to be miserable. And so I ended up quitting. We had just, you know, bought a condo, which was a great move. I took a job for one third the pay working at a place called Talk Radio Network, which was the syndicator for a bunch of uh, nationally oh, yeah. syndicated radio hosts. Yeah. Uh, and the deal that I made with the head of the company, Mark Masters, was that I would do corporate legal like half the time. I'd be kind of the secondary attorney there. They had a primary. Um, I'd be a, an associate about four hours a day. And the other four hours, I was going to, I told him, I'm only going to do this if I get to learn the basics of production. I want to like sit in the room. I want to cut audio. I want to see how the monologues are done. I want to see like how everything in this industry works. And so I got like really in the guts of it. From that trajectory came everything else, right? You had to, I had to take a step 
a couple steps back financially in order to take steps forward because I was learning the thing, getting expert at the thing that I want to be expert at. And then you try and you fail and you try and you fail and you try and then you hit. And, and I think that's the story for a lot of people who get, you know, really, really, you know, wealthy is, is that you got to fail a lot. Absolutely. And I think you're right that the um, politicians stating that they are your answer for prosperity is a lie from the pit of hell. And I just, I rail on it on our shows about that what happens in your house is a thousand times more important than what happens in the White House as far as the trajectory of your future success. Neither party is going to make your life awesome. I'm old. I've seen both parties in office. Neither party has sent me money. Neither one of them have caused me to be successful. I've done stupid things under both of them. I've done really smart <laughs> exactly. things under both of them. And the results of the stupid things or smart things that I did are what I inherited. Well, this is why Bill Clinton didn't send me any money. He didn't curse me. He didn't bring my life to an end or anything else. And, and George W. didn't. And Ronald Reagan didn't. And uh, neither one of these two will. Well, that's why it drives me up a wall when you hear politicians say, I created this number of jobs. No, you no, you didn't. No, you By didn't. what standard, what business did you start that you created exactly. that number of jobs? And if you did create jobs in the in the public sector, how much money did you have to steal from people in the private sector in order to redirect it to people that, that you think are now going to vote for you? You know, I actually just told President Trump that in the interview the other day. I said, when you tell people, when politicians tell people they created jobs, it pisses people like me off because we know we create the jobs. So since small business is the backbone of the American economy, 54% of the gross domestic product, then what are you going to do to unleash small businesses to create jobs? Because that's who most people work for. That was my question to him. And he kind of chuckled and went, well, you know, that's right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I think there's something in the American soul that's been enervated and put down for a long time. And the way that we discuss wealth and the way we discuss money in this country has been wrong for a long time. This idea that the wealthy are, quote unquote, the privileged or the lucky. I mean, yes, obviously there's an element of luck. Obviously, we, we all have the privilege of living in the greatest country in the history of the world. Some of us have more privileges than others in the sense that we were born smarter or born more handsome or, you know, we're born more athletic. But the reality is that that's the part you can't control. And so when we talk about wealth that way, what we're doing is talking about all the stupid things that, that you can't control. The thing that you can control is how you approach the world. And there's a saying that we have at our company that we, we kind of, you know, started trafficking in early on. We started hiring employees, which is you can't, you can't teach hungry. Right. I, I can do I can I can teach you all sorts of skills. I can make you better at your job, but I cannot teach you if you're not hungry. And Americans, I, I feel like, have lost hungry or at least they've forgotten how to be hungry. But I think that deep in the American soul, there is a desire again to be pioneers. There's there's a desire to be entrepreneurial. There's a desire to, to actually go out there and conquer. And that, that's a good thing. We've gotten away from this sort of aggressive language with regard to how to approach the world. Yeah. But that but that that language is good. I think you have a duty to succeed. I think that this 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 idea that it's a matter of, you know, moral apathy, whether you make the decisions that lead to success or not, is really terrible. You have a duty to at least try to succeed. You have a duty to make the good decisions. And you have to take that burden on yourself. And when you do, you'll be freer because it'll, it'll, you'll be in the flow. You'll, you'll feel the thing. You'll feel like you have a pathway to success. There's something about putting that harness on and leaning into it that, uh, that stimulates you. It really does. And, you know, we've got uh, about 1,100 team members and well over 400 of them are Gen Z. And, you know, for the people watching this, I, I'm greatly encouraged about Hungry because in Gen Z, there is a group of them that are tremendously hungry. They, they are missional. They, they'll charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. Uh, and then there's a group of them that are useless, completely <laughs> useless, right? And, and there's kind of no middle ground. Like baby boomers, we would at least lie and, you know, and say we were useful, you know, but they won't even lie. They'll just look at you and say, I'm useless. Or they'll say... Let me in. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. But by, by the way, I think that, that that last point is really important is that what that says, there there has now been created in the United States a permission structure for uselessness. Right? It used yeah. to be that if you, if, you, if you were, you know, lazy, you didn't want to do the work, you at least had to pretend that you weren't lazy and that you did want to do the work. And now there's been a permission structure that's been created Quiet by our politics. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. Every, every time people talk about, well, is it really that good that you're committed so much to your work? Is it good that you're spending so much time at work? Now, listen, if you have a bad work-life balance, meaning... You know, first of all, I don't even like the term work-life balance because That's work is part true. of your life. But if, if, if the idea is you're spending so much time at work, you're not spending the proper amount of time with your family, that's a real concern. You need to rejigger your life. I mean, I have to make conscious decisions about when to stop working to spend time with my kids. But that's not what people are talking about. What they really mean by work-life balance is that work 
is something terrible. It's a burden that you take yep. upon yourself. And if only the markets were nice and friendly, then you just get everything you want handed to you. If we just had the Star Trek replicator machine, we just hand you everything that you want. And that's really the natural state of things. And it's like, that is not even remotely the natural state of things. The natural state of things is people dying at the age of 30 from some terrible disease while living in the outdoors, right? That's the natural state of things. That'll make you grateful. Yeah, it, Americans, very few Americans have spent a lot of time in you know other places of the world that are a lot poorer. And by the way, you don't have to go that far. They don't have to be that much poorer. You can go to places in in Latin America where the corruption is endemic. I mean, truly endemic. You just walk off the plane. I, we, my wife and I went to Panama recently, and literally we got off the tour guide had to bribe a cop like at the airport. I mean, that that sort of stuff is is really really common. You should be grateful to live in a country where if you try to bribe a cop, you're probably going to get arrested, right? Like the 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 level of of honesty in America is extraordinary. The level of consistency and application of rules, yes, there are problems, but compared to other countries is astonishing. If you can't succeed in America, where where precisely are you going to succeed? And what does success look like to you? Yeah, I spent 16 days in December in Egypt, and I just got back from 14 days in Turkey, and both of those have less than a $6,000 annual average income. And, and um, yeah, we got it good. We can download it. an app and go drive Uber and make that yeah. in a few make, months. Make that in a month wow. if you if you stay in your car enough. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So you're on the campaign trail. I'm curious because it sounds like what you guys are talking about is the job of the politician and the government is to create an environment where people can thrive and businesses can thrive. So what do you think politicians need to do? If your people get in office, what are the steps that we need to take to create that environment? Well, I mean, massive deregulation. And I think that this is something President Trump certainly understands. Cutting the red tape, that has to be done at local, state, and federal level. It is so much harder to start a business now than it was to start a business a few decades ago. And if, if you want to build a house now, then the number of, of hoops that you have to jump through doing environmental impact statements and, and, and applying to things. Now, again, it's way better here than it is in other countries. If you look at, I'm I'm very familiar with the legal system in Israel, the legal system in Israel to to build a new building in Israel, just to get the permits approved is like 270 days Uh, to do it in the state of Florida where I am is like three hours. So, but with that said, there's too much regulation. That regulation makes it very, very difficult. You need to stop confiscating people's wealth. When people make money, let them make their money and then reinvest their money in new things. We need to get rid of the systemic burden on the American economy that requires that drawdown, which is these giant welfare programs. These giant welfare programs are eating the American economy alive. And none of these politicians will take it on because when you have a a concentrated benefit and a diffuse cost, then it's very hard for politicians to actually make the case for getting rid of the program, right? When 10 people are really benefiting a lot, but a thousand people are paying one cent, it's much easier to just say to those 10 people, hey, you're getting your money. You know, everything's, everything's great for you. And all you, you're just paying one cent. But the reality is if you take one cent many, many, many times, which is what the government is doing, eventually you end up bankrupting everything. And politicians on both sides are running screaming away from this sort of stuff because the American people are not prepared to hear it. And frankly, I don't put it on the politicians. I, I really think that when it comes to the politicians, I, I deeply believe in Thomas Sowell's statement about this. It's not about electing the right people. It's about creating incentives so the wrong people do the right things. And in the end, that's on us, right? We're the voters. We're the ones who get to decide whether we hold politicians accountable for lying to us about Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or the welfare programs that are that are eating the budget. And the American people are, seem to be willing to walk right off that cliff. I can't blame the politicians for taking advantage. I blame them for lying, I blame them for for not telling the truth, but that's what you and I are here for is to tell the truth also. I mean, I I think that I've spoken with a lot of Congress people, senators, presidents, and and one of the things that I constantly say to the politicians is, your job is not my job and my job is not your job. Your job is to go get 80% of the loaf and my job is to define what the loaf looks like. And what I see from the politicians is them trying to do our job and us trying to do their job, meaning we are afraid to tick off our audiences by saying the thing that might be unpopular because not enough people are willing to agree with the idea that they're free to succeed in America. You might piss somebody off, right? And so there's audience capture in the commentariat. And then for politicians, they want to pretend that the 80% that they're getting is 100% because that's how you win. You pretend that actually you cut the single best deal in the history of humankind, even when you only got 50% of the loaf. And, and so what you'll do is you'll pretend, well, sure, I didn't touch welfare, or Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, but I solved all our budget problems and we're going to soar into the future. It's like, no, now, now you're lying. So I think both, both the commentariat and the, and the political sphere have to stop lying. I think both of them are lying. I think the very first time I saw you um, was some YouTube clips of you taking questions on woke subjects from college kids. And uh, that's probably 
gosh, you and I have been friends for almost uh, t- almost 10 years, so that's probably 10 or 15 years ago. Some of those clips, the first time I saw them, and I think it was Rachel was at the lake house. She said, you got to see this oh, Ben yeah. Shapiro, man. The that Look at what he's doing. Like ben Shapiro wreck Rachel, destroys. Rachel yeah, exactly, Look, yeah. he just, he, he's destroying. But one of the things that struck me with that, and I think one of the things that's appealing about those clips and even about your show, and sometimes we get it on our stuff, but we're a little uh, a, a little different t- take on it is this uh, sense that it's like your pulse rate doesn't change on these things. You know, there's this thing of uh, you're, uh, I want to say not afraid, but that's not it. You don't get amped up at all. It's almost as if when you're debating someone, you're toying with them. (laughs) Um, You're you're a chess master and you've seen four moves ahead and they're done. So we're going to go ahead and enjoy the ride. You know, that kind of a thing is the way it feels. Um, Have you always been that way or did you develop that confidence as you as you did it more? I think. Some both. Uh, I think you get better at it the more you do it. And there are times where you still have to remind yourself to stay calm, depending on how inflammatory the topic you're taking on is. I remember just this year when I went to Oxford University in the aftermath of October 7th. And obviously, you know, I know people whose family members are kidnapped in in the Gaza Strip. I know multiple families who have lost family who are soldiers in, in Gaza. I know many people right now who are serving in Lebanon. So I have, you know, a pretty close stake in, in that particular conflict and, and in October 7th and, and all the rest. And uh, and I was, you know, facing down students who actively were calling for the destruction of the state of Israel and defending Hamas and Hezbollah and all this. I, and going in, I kind of had to say to myself, listen, just stay calm. Just stay calm. Just don't get angry. Just stay calm. That, that's that's fairly rare. Uh, I, t- I tend to be more analytic. There's there's sort of a mode that I go into. And this, this is the part that's kind of natural. I'm not sure why it, it occurred. Maybe it's from being bullied as a kid, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> where, where almost, I can see myself almost in third person doing the thing, uh, where it's like, okay, well, now we're in analysis mode, and this person's making an argument. Is it a good argument? Is it a bad argument? Let's try and kind of figure out what the what the puzzle pieces are here, force them to define terms, try and, ex- maybe I agree with them. What, what exactly is it that they're doing here? My wife hates it when this happens during a, a home argument, by the way. She'll be like, we're not in a YouTube video. You need to stop this right now. <laughs> Yeah, how do you argue with Ben Shapiro at home? That feels like, is it even worth it? Uh, no, I mean, th- so... Do you ever you let know, her win just for fun? Uh, like, how does well, this I mean, work? if I'm smart, I let her win all the time, right? Exactly. I mean, that's, that, that's the smart move. But it's but yeah, the, the, the truth is my wife is really good about this sort of stuff, meaning that yeah, I'm, I'm you know, by nature a very analytic person. And so uh, I've, I've said this before, yeah, when, when I'm talking to my wife, and I will now generalize this to, to many women, uh, many women, when they present a problem, they don't want an answer. They want sympathy. And this is a mistake I made for many years at the beginning of my marriage, where my wife would come to me with a problem and be like, right, so you should do this and this and this, and then it'll be solved. And she'd be like, get angry. Like, why, 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 are, you do- like, why are you telling me that? And so I actually said to her, I, you know, I need to know at the outside of the conversation, is this a solving this thing problem? Or is this a you just want me to hear you? conversation like which one which one of these is it and she's she's nice enough to actually like be honest about that <laughs> let me That's know good good marriage technique and i've heard right she's there. one of the nicest people in the world so opposites yes. do attract apparently <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you exactly said. no she she yeah everyone everyone loves my wife my wife is a sweetheart so are you in that same vein a lot of your brand has been built around controversy you're stepping into extremely controversial things or sometimes you create it um is this intentional or is it just a value? This is something I value and I need to go there. And if controversy happens, so be it. It's more the latter. I really try not to say uncalibrated things for the sake of just drawing fire. Everything that I say, I feel like I could say in a more inflammatory fashion just to get clicks. I really try to calibrate my language to make sure that if there's a hill that I'm going to die on, I want to die on a hill of my own choosing. And and what that means is that if there is a position that finds itself in controversy, then I want to state it as clearly and succinctly as I can. A boy is not a girl, right? I mean, these are things that that didn't used to be controversial, but now are very, very controversial. Uh, Or disparities are not not evidence of discrimination, right? You have to show me evidence of discrimination. Otherwise, you know, there might be a confound in in, in what you're talking about. Like that that has now become a controversial statement. But I, I really try not to just initiate you know, firefights for the sake of initiating firefights. I try to be pretty careful about the language that I use. And, and frankly, I find it irritating when people are deliberately vague when they use semantic overload in order to do that. You'll see people do this, again, criticizing my own industry, but you'll see people do this. They'll say something mm-hmm. that is perceived by, say, our side of the aisle as perfectly obvious and is perceived by the other side of the aisle as the most controversial thing ever. And if they had just said it in the way that they actually meant it, it wouldn't be controversial at all. So instead of talking about, say, 
Yeah, to, to take just a, a random example, a uh, pretty famous commentator on the right at one point was suggesting that immigration was making our country dirty. And this was perceived by the right as, okay, there are people who are coming across our border who come from cultures where they don't clean the streets as often, and that means there's more trash on the streets sometimes, and that's, that's a bad thing. And then people on the left are like, he's talking about racially dirty. If you're on the right, you read that's semantic overload. It's a, it's a term that, that can be interpreted a variety of ways. If the commentator just said, what I mean is the first thing. What I mean is when people come here and they come from a culture where there isn't regular trash pickup, they sometimes leave their garbage on the lawn and that makes the neighborhood dirtier and that has severe social consequences for everybody else who lives in the neighborhood. Now it's not even controversial, right? You know exactly what the person's saying. And I think there's a certain amount of deliberate vagueness that very often contributes to controversy that I don't particularly like because it's not, it doesn't aim at sol- it's solving the problem. You know, sometimes I think it's deliberate and sometimes I think it's almost mental laziness. Mm-hmm. Instead of taking the time to get to the point in a concise way, in a clear way, with courage, and say, this is what I mean. And if you don't like that, that's okay. Right. But this is what I mean. And that requires some uh, extra mental gymnastics, and it requires an extra level of backbone to step in and go be, be very, very clear. If you're going to be mad at me, let's be mad at me about the, the, right, it, re- exactly. the right reason. This is one of the things that drives me absolutely up a wall is, is when people will they'll use words like they without an antecedent. Right? They're out to get you. It's like, well, I, I need to know who they is. Yeah, we get right. that in the financial world. They said and I heard. Right. It, so it, what horrible financial planning firm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you see this all the time in politics. Well, they're doing X. They're doing Y. Can we even know the who they are? If you tell me who they are, I can, I, I can verify it. I can say whether it's false, whether I think that it's true. And you see this about, say, election 2020. And people will say the election was rigged. But okay, I need specifics. What are you talking about specifically when you say the election was rigged? Do you mean that members of the legacy media hid the Hunter Biden laptop story in the lead up to the election in order to help Joe Biden? Totally agree. If that's what you mean by rigged, 100% agree. If by rigged you mean that in the middle of the night in Fulton County, there were people who were bringing in U-Hauls full of ballots and then just shoving them through the machines, I need some evidence of that. Right? But people will use rigged and they'll just mean all those things to all those people. And then if you say, well, I don't think, I don't agree with you the way you're talking about that. And it's like, well, that's because you're on the other side. Right? It, it, it's a way of creating artificial division rather than clarity. And, and that, that I find pretty reprehensible. In, oh, it's, in, it's, it's where we've devolved from arguing about ideas. And instead, we argue about hyperbole. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to. Have you found that you know, with the onset of Instagram reels and TikTok and shorts, it exacerbates it? It's kind of like when you just see the headline and snap judgment start commenting and there's no context. For sure. Know, for the full hour long piece you did on the subject versus this 30 second clip you saw. And, and that also means that that it's very easy to deliberately mischaracterize other people's viewpoints. And so you know, th- that happens all the time yep. where where somebody will, will claim that you said a thing that you clearly did not say. In fact, you may have said precisely the opposite or you clarified it in a particular way in the middle of, you know, a 15 minute segment or an hour segment. And they'll pick out one sentence, and then because people have an attention span of 7.3 seconds, you know, whatever it is, you know, people will, will see that, and then they'll just think that's your view from now on. I mean, the, the comments that we started with about retirement are a perfect example of this. I wasn't saying that you can never retire, that you have to be 90 year old working in a salt mine. Ben hates old people. Right, exactly. That was, for, for like two weeks, that was the narrative. The narrative was, I remember they did the same thing during COVID, right? During COVID, I was saying that just on an, on an insurance basis, we should treat years lost of life as one of the stats that we use in measuring the impact of COVID. Meaning that if you're talking about you know, who to protect and who to shield, we should be shielding the elderly. That's that's the number one job. But we should be tranching people who are younger back into the workforce because those people are not really going to get sick and they're really not going to die. They're going to be fine. If you're talking about you know past pandemics, this pandemic compared to other pandemics is targeting particularly not kids, not people who are young and healthy. It's particularly targeting people who are older and have multiple pre-existing conditions, which means that it's a less damaging pandemic than past pandemics in certain ways, right? Not in terms of every human life is, is valuable, but if you're just talking about like cost of years lost, then you're, you're talking about people who are 85 who are dying at 85 as opposed to 86. That's horrible. It's a tragedy. It's awful. It's also not the same thing as a nine-year-old child dying. And we all know that, right? If, if millions of nine-year-old children have been dying of COVID, then people would have been willing to undertake pretty much any measure in order to quote unquote, slow the spread, right? But it, it, so I said that, and the takeaway from the media was, Shapiro fine with, with dead old people. And it's like, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying what is a perfectly obvious point. But you know, if you can boil things down into their most controversial and stupid form, people like being pissed. People people like the feeling of getting passionate on the internet. And, and it'll get views and clicks at the yeah, end of the day. Lots of, uh, yeah, I've noticed a lot of people have made a really good living off of doing that, off of my stuff, right? Making a, a solid secondary living off of- uh, Just off reacting, of, to things reacting to say. things that you Reacting to things that I say. I'm, I'm really good for clicks. Exactly. Yeah, for things I didn't say. Well, proud of you guys. 
again, we said at the opening, and we're proud of you to have you as friends and neighbors. And uh, we love watching your success and watching your talent and all the good things you're doing. Very well done. And I uh, appreciate you t- t- taking time to sit down with us on long form here. No, it's always appreciate great to it. see you. It's a blast. Ben Shapiro, ladies and gentlemen. Ben Shapiro. Thanks, Ben. This is The Ramsey Show.